Hello everybody, uh, welcome to the first episode of Behind the Science. My name is Damon Stanwell-Smith, I'm the Head of Science and Sustainability here at Viking, and I'm talking to you from Cambridge in the UK. Um, we're at Cambridge University's Scott Polar Research Institute in their beautiful library. And I'm accompanied today by a, uh, an extraordinary polar explorer. I'm going to give a list of, of adjectives to describe his uh, various aspects of his career. He is uh, an explorer, he is an author, he is a surveyor, he trained as a civil engineer, and as we'll discover in our conversation, has a long history uh, and a family connections associated with all things to do with the Antarctic. So welcome, Jonathan Walton, uh, to Viking TV. Ah, oh, thanks, Damon. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm slightly amazed to be here because I'm just an ordinary person that has been very lucky in life, and I've spent a lot of my life in the Antarctic. But uh, yeah, carry on. <laughs> well, I've described the various things that you've done. Um, in for both of us, I know in conversations we've had before that that being in the Antarctic is about being enthusiastic and. Uh, a feeling for an extraordinary place and you of almost anyone I know does have a long threads both from family and your own personal professional experiences um, to the white continent. Uh, absolutely I mean I felt an involvement with the white continent from my earliest years I remember going to the Royal Geographical Society in London and watching my dad do the Christmas children's lecture about Antarctica and I thought, oh, that's my dad. He's good, isn't he? You know, very proud of him. But I never in my wildest dreams as I was growing up thought that's something I would do. It's something he did after the war. And well, wasn't that great? And I'm very proud of him. But can I, can I pick you up when you mention that your dad? Please, oh, my dad. Please do elaborate on who, my dad, you, who your father is. My father was Kevin Walton. Uh, he served in the war uh, as an engineer officer and was highly decorated through the war on destroyers and submarine hunting and things. And, but somewhere during the war, or before the war, his tutor at university had been Alfred Stevenson, who'd been two years in the Antarctic in the 1930s. And during the war, my dad then met up with Lancelot Fleming, one-time director of the Scott Polar Institute here, and got to know him and made it clear that he was an Ant really wanted to go to the Antarctic. Lancelot had to gently point out that um, there was a war going on, and, but Dad got his name on a list somewhere. And at the end of the war, he was in, on his way back from the Far East where he'd finished the war and got a telegram saying, if you're still uh, a volunteer to go to the Antarctic, get your backside to, back to London as quickly as you can because you're going to leave in three weeks, uh, which he did. And he, in due course, he, he spent his two and a half years in the Antarctic and uh, wrote books, gave talks and... So I grew up with this around me and I still had absolutely no inclination or I thought it was just something that happened in the 40s. And only in my final year at university, I was literally in my last two terms and uh, there I was. And then Alfred Stevenson, who was still on the uh, staff at Imperial College, came into my drawing office, said, this job might suit you, Jonathan. And he knew that he knew my son. He knew my dad because he'd yes. been my dad's tutor at Imperial in the third, in the late thirties. Wow. And 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 I looked at this advertisement. It said surveyor wanted for the Antarctic, and in literally in five seconds I thought that's what I'm going to do. It was like a bolt hitting me. And so the next morning I went down to the headquarters of the Antarctic Survey in Gillingham Street in London, and I went up to the secretary and said. Um, I th excuse me, I think I want to go to the Antarctic. Could I talk to somebody about this? And the secretary said, well, Mr. Walton, I'll, I'll see if Mr. Salmon is available. And Mr. Salmon's available, would you come this way? And Eric Salmon, who was head of HR there, he, um, he sat me down and he said, well, Mr. Walton, you, know, you gather you want to go to the Antarctic. And how long have you wanted to do this? I said, about 24 hours. Wow. And, and I, he said, well, look, this is a very sudden thing, but are you sure about this? Because it's a big commitment. I said, but now I know I could. It's my, my whole life has been leading towards this. I just never, why, why is it? 
why has it been leaving? Well, my father was involved with the... Who's your father? And I just said, well, my father's Kevin Walton. I, I won't say exact the words, but he said, who, well, well, mm, me, mate. That's amazing. How is the old bugger? <laughs> and mm. that's what he said. Um, and, uh, and, and he says, I know your dad quite well. And he said, but it won't get you a job. And, you know, I didn't get the job. Oh, really? I didn't get the job because I was applying as a surveyor. And they said, well, we like you. You're the right person, um, the right attributes, but you're not a trained surveyor, which I wasn't. Um, so I said, OK, fine. So I was disappointed. And I said, but where can I train to be a surveyor? University College London went there to find that my tutor, when I signed on for the course, which I did the same day, had been my father's tent mate in the Antarctic for two years. So, you know, this just... Yes. And I went into surveying purely as a way of getting to the Antarctic. But in my year, academic year as a surveyor, I thought, this is exactly what I want to do. I loved surveying from the very start. It just happened the way it had been taught to me as an undergraduate was very poor. But surveying, I just thought, this is my, my mm. vocation. And if it also gets me to the Antarctic, that's a different, you know, another story. But I understand that some of your training also was in this place in Cambridge. Was that, was that in that same time? Gosh, once you get me started about yes, this, you yes. know. Well, I'd applied to Bass as a surveyor, the British Antarctic Survey, in 1973. And um, this was the second time of asking, because I didn't get it the previous year. And I then um, would, I was in a flat with some friends in London, and I'd been away for 10 days on a field course, came back, we were having a right party, Late one evening, the phone had only been installed two days before. The phone rang, and on the phone, I, I went down. It's for you, Jonathan. I went down. Hello, Jonathan. This is Dr. Charles Swithinbank from the British Antarctic Survey mm, here. Yeah. I see you've um, got an application to be a surveyor in the Antarctic. And I said, yes, I have. I wasn't quite sober. He said, well, I, I'm looking for a glaciologist with surveying training. Would you come for an interview on Tuesday in London? I said... Sorry, I'm going climbing in the Lake District. I've got a holiday. Oh, well, would you come up to the Scott Polar Institute a week later and have an interview? And that's exactly what I did. And he said, you're exactly what I'm looking for. Um, a, you've, you've had an interview last year. I know psychologically you're the right person, but now you're trained. And in that week, I'd also found out a bit more about glaciology, which I didn't know much about and found out, actually, this looks really interesting, and to apply my surveying knowledge. Mm. And so I accepted there and then, at the Scott Polar, upstairs, I, I shook his hand and we, I had a job. And uh, uh, the whole circle, of course, is that back in 1949, my dad and my godfather had interviewed Charles Swithinbank for his first job in the Antarctic. So yes. it's just, it, it's, it's, it's people. It's, it's a family connection. business, clearly. Family it's not connections. a family, it's, but so much of life is all about the people. Yes, and that, that's what makes life interesting. Life is meeting people. Lancelot Fleming's book, Life is Meeting, and, and that's his bio, auto, autobiography. And it's, that's what life is about. It's the people you meet. And, and I don't know whether maybe both of our experiences in our careers that it feels to me that those that have been working in the Antarctic, that everybody seems, it's the human connections, it's that, it's that sort of visceral connection to the place and that it gets passed on from human connections. It's certainly it's similar to my own experience as well. Yes, but I certainly never un understood that as I was growing up. Yes. My dad was an Antarctic explorer, was quite well known, but that was his job. And I, I, it was only, as I say, as an undergraduate, I suddenly thought, oh, it could be my job too. And, and did he tell you lots of stories? Because, um, because a lot of people from the war maybe were no, not, were not so didn't. much airing their But I went to a few of his lectures. Okay. I had to operate the projector. I, I got paid uh, two shillings to operate the projector on one of his lectures yeah. back in the 60s. And so, but they were very dated, his, his slides, because it was talking about the 1940s. And it was a, a, quite an eye-opener to me how much I knew this had to be my vocation. When it, when it came upon me, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And, and I've wanted to and have been lucky enough to continue working in the Antarctic for 50-something years. Yes. <laughs> and was it very formative when you did you first, you went for two winters, the I did two typical and a half years. British Antarctic survey? I left here in contract. November, October the 31st, 1973, and I came back on May the 29th, 1976. 
and yet yeah, formative and how. I mean, I mm. shared a hut with three other people and for nine months at a time we didn't see anyone else. We weren't always in the hut, we were out sledging and, and travelling around doing our work, but absolutely formative. I mean, mm -hmm. it, uh, if I said every moment was easy, I'd be lying. Because and, and which, which, which base were you? Were uh, you a base at? called Fossil Bluff. Right. It was, the reason we had to be there, we were inland, because we were studying the ice shelf, and in the summer the ice shelf was very much surface melted, we couldn't travel on it, so we had to be there during the winter. And mm. that's why it, the, the year I left was the year they closed that base as a wintering base. It was very basic conditions, but oh, I, I wouldn't have wanted anything else. And, and you just learn to live. I mean, and Fossil Bluffs on the Antarctic Peninsula? On just, the Antarctic Peninsula, so on Alexander Island. Alexander Island. Yes. And if I tell you that my first winter there, um, of the other three people, uh, Roger, when we got back to this country, Roger I helped, I shared a house with in Cambridge for a while. When Graham got married, a year and a half later after we got back, I was his best man. And the third one, Jim, became a great friend and later married my sister. So, so you know, right. yes, it's, did it's, we get on? It's, it's yes, we did get on. Family things again, yes. But that's, I think, something when you're living in that sort of environment, you, you've just got to get on. Even if you're not feeling very happy towards that person that day, mm -hmm. you think, well, I'm stuck with you, so we're just going to get on. And, that, and that's an important a really important aspect of people. And you must have seen that in your time in Antarctica. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I also, my three years in, yeah. the, in the mid 90s, from 92 to 95, yeah. uh, this was at Sydney Station, yeah. uh, another of the Antarctic, British Antarctic Survey bases in the South Orkneys. I still, it's, even though that's over 30 years ago, it still resonates, even being in the Scott Polar Research Institute Library. Yeah. It reminds me of, preparing for going south and and everything that's done since was very much shaped by that initial that initial experience yes um well when when i first joined bass they did not have a centralized operation okay they had the admin offices in victoria in london they had life sciences in monkswood north of cambridge earth science uh, sorry um geology in birmingham university different departments all over the country and glaciology was based at the Scott Polar Institute. So on the 2nd of July, 1973, I came here, and this was my first day at work for Bass. And I spent wow. three months here, and basically, here's and welcome, some- Welcome back, I should say. Yeah, yeah. and, and it was so similar to what it is today. Yes. Except Bass had an office here downstairs, and, and I had three months. It's like um, giving an alcoholic an unlimited drinks. I was told, yes, there's some books I want you to read and papers I want you to read, but there's a library there, just go and get on with it. And mm -hmm. it was like, oh my gosh, let me get at this. And by then I was totally, although I hadn't been there at that stage, I, I knew this is what I wanted to do and I couldn't get enough of, of books and reading about the background and things like and it that. And it is a lovely resource. Oh, I mean, it is, it's, it's fabulous. It, 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 you do uh, every time I'm in this library or similar. I think, gosh, I could just spend a month and just oh, gosh, work yes. my way through and just scratch the surface of yeah. all the different collections here. And um, so, when you were in Fossil Bluff, you were working as in glaciology and and survey. Was it still surveying at that time? I was, but how, it was, was applied surveying. I, yes. I, was, I was using surveying measurements to measure ice dynamics, how much, how fast glaciers and ice shelves moved how they stressed and strained, because the, the, the forces on the ice bend the ice. And I mean, a kilometre stretch of ice could be a thousand metres one year, a year later it's a thousand and seven. So it's, it's expanding and contracting in all different mm. directions. And surveying became a very powerful tool. And I know Charles said to me, he said, to find someone who was actually a trained surveyor to do this was a big leap forward for him. Up to then they'd had um, very good people, but they weren't trained surveyors. And, and until I trained as a surveyor, I didn't understand how involved it could be. And I wrote a number of research papers. But in addition to that, we were drilling holes in the ice. And it was and, um, and bringing back samples, of, not bringing back samples, of, but taking samples of ice, ice cores, just 10 metres. It was very much exploratory stuff. Because mm -hmm. they just invented a new technique where they, if you... Let, let, let's go back a, a step here because... Ice is formed in two different ways. You can have water freezing or you can have snow compacted and compacted and compacted until mm. it becomes dense and ice. 
Now the compacted ice has actually got bubbles of air in because the snow was what came down from the sky and then it, it, got, it got compacted and mm -hmm. so there's bubbles of air. Now that bubbles of, those bubbles of air was what was in the atmosphere when that piece of snow fell from the heaven. Yes. So if you drill down 10 metres in the sort of environment I was working yes, it's you going back go, in time. Yeah. You'd go back 25 years in time, yes. 30 years in time. And if you analyse the oxygen content of those little air bubbles, you can tell what the temperature of the air was when that snow came from the sky. It's called oxygen isotope, two particular isotopes of oxygen. And they just invented this technique in Denmark in, in 1970, early 70s. So the first hole I drilled in the Antarctic was a 10 metre hole and it was the first hole the British had drilled for oxygen mm. isotope analysis. Now they've drilled back down to I think 3,800 metres, yeah. and then go back 800,000 years of time. And that is a direct measurement of climate change of the Earth. It's, and it's, it's not it's just... Now, a, a old slow, ice is the way, isn't it? it it's yeah. just amazing. If it goes up and down like this, 150,000 year periods, and we're not talking about a degree or two, we're talking 12 or 14 degrees. Yeah. So it's an amazing tool looking Absolutely. at Earth climate history. But and, and right in the early days... In your experience with surveying... The way I see it is there is no substitute for being in situ, on the ground, collecting, although the technology has changed. And, and I guess surveyors of an age do maybe see that change in technology. What are your I've reflections on that? Completely. I mean, the surveying department of Bath was using surveying, very tedious, long distance measurements to provide... A, a skeleton on which to hang the aerial photographs that had been taken in the 1940s and 50s. Mm. But suddenly in 1973, the first Landsat imagery came in, images taken from the satellite, and suddenly there on a piece of paper in front of you, you had an image of what it was. And there was one island that was on the map was 27 kilometres out of place, mm. um, Sharko Island. And... But so Baz said, well, if we put lines around these, what is obviously the coastline, and a few spot heights on mountains that we know, and a few other names, um, there is a map. Why do we need to go and produce a map at 50 times the cost? So suddenly the whole surveying operation in Antarctica changed completely because they basically were using Landsat imagery. Mm. And that was when it first became available. I... I well, in my second summer in Antarctica, I got a, a side mission. Charles sent a, 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 a radio message down saying, will you take uh, your theodolite to um, Sharko Island and set it up and tell me the position, latitude and longitude of this place on Sharko Island, which I did. And, that's, and I came back, worked out the latitude and longitude, just looking at the sun. Those are the sort of skills surveyors had in those days. And... Um, came back and I said, it's this. And he said, yeah, I thought so. The British map that had been produced from some American photographs showed the island 27 kilometres out of position. Yes. So I, I moved so. Sharko Island you moved 27 island. kilometres, which is... Well, I'm sure Sharko would have been very grateful. <laughs> and how did you get around? Because I'm, I, I know that your father was very well known for uh, dog travel and indeed a, a mutual friend and colleague, uh, Nick Cox, uh, has been on Viking TV describing his experiences with, with dog travelling. Was it using dogs or were you, um, were you, were you in the mechanised era? I was just at the, at the cusp. Yes. When I originally applied to come south as a surveyor, the, I would have been at Stonington Island and I would have been using dogs. And that to me was, wow, that's exciting. And then, I, as I said, I got this call, would you like to be a glaciologist? And I came for the interview here and he said... From your point of view, the only downside about this, there's lots of good things you'll be doing, but the only downside is you won't be driving dogs. You'll be driving skidoos, little snowmobiles, mm. right at the early stages of skidoos. And, but by then I'd actually done a bit of research about what glaciology meant. And I hadn't told him, but I had worked as a glaciologist before in Canada, but yeah. that was just between me and the gatepost. And, um, and so I, I realised, OK... That was, I wasn't going to drive dogs, but I was going to do some really interesting work, and that's actually appealed to me a lot. And so, um, and was that I, using small aircraft then? 
So no, no, no. So no. We, we were deploying straight from Fossil no, we Bluff were coming, into the... We were having to spend the winter at Fossil Bluff because only then the ice shelf froze on the surface. Right, OK. So then we could travel hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles up and down with skidoos, early skidoos, uh, people, dog drivers say, oh, they're not very reliable, and they weren't. Um, we had a mechanic, Roger, and at the uh, Fossil Bluff, and he put some skidoos on the map as good, reliable uh, machines. Mm. And then the new generation that came through in 76 were really good machines. And it was in 74 that the decision was made to close Stonington and actually phase out Huskies in Antarctica. Yes. And... Um, and that was a, a lot of controversial thing at the time. But, of course, Huskies uh, were great. When you were travelling in unknown territory, you didn't know what the thing was like and you had no other way of getting to this area apart from surface travel. Mm. You needed something that was 100% reliable. Skidoos weren't. Huskies no. were. They were slow. They were frustrating, full of character, moody, as were the people, of course, um, but wonderful to work with. And I know Dad was very disappointed when I got the job. And he said, but you won't work with dogs. I said, no, but I think I will have a much more interesting actual job yes. um, of the science that I was doing. And the science was fantastic. I did a few days with dogs, just for almost for, for fun. But no, I was the start of the mechanical age. And, and in 76, they announced that um, dogs would be completely phased out and skidoos brought in. And the whole way of doing um, Antarctic research changed. The planes by then had proved to be very good twin otter aircraft. Yes. And they were exceptionally good with superb pilots. So you could put a complete uh, camping unit into a twin otter, drop it off at a certain place, and then the skidoos could go around and do the business. And when they broke down, as they inevitably did, you just flew a replacement skidoo. Quite often you didn't try and repair it. You just flew a replacement. Just flew another one in, yes. And, and that changed the whole... So the emphasis was not on long winter journeys unsupported. The emphasis became on summer science because summer science, when the sun's out 24 hours a day, is so much more efficient. It's so much more effective and efficient to work at minus 10 than minus 40. Yes. Um, in, the, in the winter, it's dark almost the whole time and working at minus 30s, minus 40s, it's bloody hard work. Absolutely. Um, it, I mean... Yeah, I, I, I was a diver in those conditions. Yeah. And do you know, actually, as a diver, uh, in the 90s, I believe that we got the snowmobiles from probably the stations that, from your era yeah. given to the divers. We had the old, the really old... Yes. Yeah. The, the nice new ones were given to the surveyors yeah. and, the, and the glaciologists. We got the old ones because um, we would routinely drop them into the, the sea yeah. accidentally through ice holes. So I feel that I had those same skidoos, but 20 years on, and they were fairly temperamental. Yeah, they were. But in those cold temperatures. But we, we certainly learnt to work with them. They were, oh, very frustrating at times. But when I came back to Bass in, in the 80s, um, they had a new generation of skidoos. And I remember going to a glacier deep south, 79 degrees south, and they said, it's all right, the skidoos are already there. What do you mean? Oh, we left them there last year. And, and put them in a depot, so they're covered in tarpaulins. We got there, um, found the, 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 the marker drum, dug down. There were four skidoos, dug them out, put a new battery in, and pressed the button. Two-stroke rotaxes that, Absolutely. that do far um, up. Yes, to me, so, it was an yeah. eye-opener. How good skidoos Cylinders rattling in the block, but still uh, running. But no, they weren't even... They were just really good machines. Yeah. And also, the, the assistance to the uh, scientists had been taught in skidoo maintenance and um, yes it's not romantic maintaining a skidoo but it's very efficient no, very effective and and the when I joined Bass the director was Sir Vivian Fuchs and um, he was old old generation and he loved the dog teams um, uh, Dick Laws who took over loved the science and he said we've got to look at look at ahead and things massively changed yes and there's no doubt that um, the uh, output from BAS um, in terms of scientific interest uh, and scientific papers uh, mushroomed completely under the new director. But there were things that, at least in my experience with the British Antarctic Survey, and I guess yours too, where when something had worked out to work well, it was continued. 
Now, I happen to know you've brought today um, a model that your dad made to demonstrate how um, a particular style of field camps are set up, which is certainly how I trained in the 90s, and I think it traces all the way back to maybe even Scott's Discovery Expeditions of 1902, um, of a particular type of tent and sledge uh, designed by Christoph Nansen. I wondered if we could go and uh, yeah, have yeah. a look at how it's all assembled to sort of maybe imagine how you were when you were in those fields. Dave, it's uncanny how our brains seem to yeah. go a lot in similar parallel lines. I was about to come on and say, I'd like to show you some of the stuff we've got. And um, Nansen sledges, yes. designed by Nansen, evolved over the years, um, but the principle of it was the same. Uh, tents evolved over the years, but the pyramid shape was still the same. But should we, yeah, we, we go and have, yeah, have a look? Yeah, let's go and have a look. Let's go have a look. This, Damon, is a model Nansen sledge. Fantastic. It was made about 70 years ago. It's been in our family ever since it was made. And this is a quarter size. So the real Nansen sledge, which was the original Nansen, was designed by Fritjof Nansen, of course, in the in late 1800s. And all modern Nansen sledges are an offshoot of that. Improvement, modern materials. Um, and so this is... We've used this. I've actually taken this to Antarctica before when I worked down there as a lecturer. And, um, and it's a wonderful... Now... And everything's quarter size. Everything's quarter size. Now, when you're travelling on an Anson sledge, you're carrying everything you need. The most important thing you need is a tent. So this was made in 1949 or 50 and is exactly a quarter size pyramid tent. And there it is. And so when you're... Oops. That is a quarter size pyramid tent there. And so it's ent you enter it through a sleeve. Now, this is your home. Could be for the next six weeks. Whatever the weather's going to throw at you, you're going to live in there and feel comfortable and secure. So when you stop the sledge at the end of the day, you're probably cold and you all you really like is a cup of tea. But it's not time for that yet. Now, you've got two people sharing this tent. You're never yeah. working alone. And there's always an inside man and an outside man. So the inside man is going to get off the sledge, we put the tent up, and then he's going to go inside. It could be a he or a she nowadays. It was In my early days, it was a, a he, always. And they're going to set up a home in there. So they're in there. OK, put the ground sheet in. Yeah, they put the ground sheet in. Sleeping bags. In fact, they didn't even have to call. We've done this so many times. Yes. That we yeah. just... Pass them in. Pass yep. them in. Pass them in. Sleeping bags. And he's now in there getting the sleeping bags. Next thing he knows that's wanted is a cup of tea. Right. So the f next thing will be the box, and that contains the cooker, the tilly lantern, the saucepans, and everything else you need. And that goes in. He's now setting up the, the primus cooker. And that's all paraffin. That's all paraffin, because paraffin, yes. paraffin's good in whatever low temperatures you've got. Yeah, um, yeah you certainly can't use gas or anything like that, because no. it just doesn't come out of the tin. And the next thing he'll want is, and again, he doesn't have to say anything. I, I just, I'm the outside man. I know the order he wants these boxes. The next thing that I will pick up is the box of food. There's enough food in there for probably the next four or five days. That's our day-to-day -day food box. That goes in. He's setting it all up in the way that we've agreed. Um, the next thing that goes in is really important, and that's the personal box. If you can imagine, there's a partition down the middle... Half of it contains my personal stuff that I want for the next six weeks. Half of it is my tent mates. And that's all we're allowed to take of personal stuff. Mm. There's not a lot of space. So there'll be books in there. Uh, in the 70s, there was a, maybe a small reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Okay. Writing paper and, and uh, writing letters. Um, maybe a pack of cards, a Scrabble board. If you take a Scrabble board, you've got to take a dictionary as well. So otherwise yes. you fight. <laughs> so the next thing that goes in is it's called the P box, the yeah. personal box. And that's going in. Again, it's all, it's all, we know exactly where it's going to be. If you wake up in the middle of the night, you know where all the boxes are. Next thing is very important. Out comes the radio, the radio transmitter. That goes in. The inside man knows it, where it's going to sit in the tent. And then the spare batteries and things in the radio sits there on the right-hand side of the entrance. This the first aid box. That sits on the left-hand side. So when you come out in a blizzard, 
you, 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 you know, need some you know me to... me medication, yeah. you know where to go in. And, and, and there are lots of other boxes. Of course, the one thing I haven't shown here are the small jerry cans of, of paraffin to uh, power the cooker. Maybe some of petrol for skidoo or dogs or whatever. And um, so there are a number of boxes holding the side of the tent down. Because you, you, what you can't do is let the snow get under here. Right. You've got to cover it here. And then the shape of a pyramid means the more the wind blows it that way, the more it's pushing this into the ground. And sometimes I've, after a long blizzard, I've woken up and we're buried in there. So we actually keep a shovel inside the tent. To dig now, yourself out. Two important things. Just inside, there's two layers in this tent, an inner and an outer. Inside the inner, on this side, are, is a bottle. Because if you're in there in a blizzard, you don't want to have to come outside for a pee. So you've got a big two-litre bottle and you can pee into a bottle, empty it into the snow, and it just makes a long hole in the snow. On the other side are blocks of snow which you can melt um, for, for all your drinking water for the next two or three days. Mm -hmm. Don't ever get the two mixed up, you see. So the left is for the pee bottle, the right is for the drinking water. And, um, and, and you know exactly how the tent works. It's the same every single day. Whoever's inside man or outside man, you develop a very well-tried routine. Now here is the pyramid, the uh, Ninesen Sledge. This is, it's built to be very flexible because when you're going over bumpy snow, look at that, it just flexes like anything because you could be mm. carrying half a ton on here and it's made of ash. It comes to the Antarctic in kit form and we actually make them ourselves and it's great fun and you literally tie it together with string. Yes. And that's how it's put together and they're very, very efficient, uh, very efficient indeed. And, um, and, that, and then if you've got a dog or skidoos pulling the sledge, the driver stands on the back and uh, directs which way things are going to go. There's the brake there. And there's the brake. Yes. And so camping in the Antarctic is a very well-tried routine. It started, British Graham Land Expedition in the 30s established that routine. My dad in the 40s with a, a member of the British Graham Land team followed it on and built it up. And the routine that bass have today in the field with a pyramid tent is almost the same. It is so I, I, good. I remember in the 90s it was, as you described, yeah. putting this in, woe betide the person with snow on got in the tent. Yeah. Um, and it is turning this to make sure you'd have runners didn't freeze. And, yes, and everything and in its place and a place for everything. And that tent. good for 100 mile an hour winds. And I've been in about 90 knot winds and um, it, you can't hear yourself think. I've even been in there and put snow screws into the snow because I was worried that this was going to blow away. Wow. But it didn't. Um, and they're absolutely solid. They're beautiful tents. And of course, all the, the guy ropes and the, um, the, that's what hold them down. I say more, so the more snow that builds up around it, the more stable it is. And when you're cooking inside, good ventilation. Cause of Always, the... there's a little vent here. Yes. The little it's, tube it's... there. The ventilation is absolutely important. Tragically, some of the, well, quite often fatalities in Antarctica have been people that have not, you know, not been sensible. Maybe uh, running generators inside tents and yeah. you, you, know, you hear yeah, the stories over the years. I mean, Monoxide people say, oh, it's such a dangerous place to be. No, it's not. If you know the rules and you respect your environment, it is a very safe place to be. But you have to always maintain that respect. If you think you're, oh, I can do this, Don't doesn't matter what the weather's going to throw at me, then you're going to cruise for mm. a, a bad time. Um, One of the things also that I see here, and actually we've got a couple of other props there, is these are natural materials. As you said, it's ash. Mm -hmm. I assume this is, this is cotton this ventile. It's ventile. It's made during the war. Um, and we, and we, have the, we have some ventile here. Yeah. So I guess we both brought our... This our, is... Ventile this is not clothing. museum stuff, this is what I wore in the Antarctic. These are the actual, I have washed them since. But, yes. Um, and so what you notice is, very baggy, because trapping air is one of the secrets. No zips, no buttons. Because you, well, if you've got big gloves on, you don't want zips and buttons. But that, that goes on. Very baggy, um, superb. And um, So that's a 1973 vintage. So we have a look at a 1992 vintage. So these oh, are my like these are my ones. So I see. A lot, and you can lot see bigger pockets, bigger pocket, but very similar, aren't they? It's just yes. as, as you say that natural, just subtle evolution, but yeah. essentially Lovely, uh, basically ventile. the same material. It's yeah. not it's not waterproof material. No, it's cotton that is very very tightly woven, and the the warp and the weft are twisted in the opposite directions, 
So when it gets wet, the, the, they try and untwist and make it tell, they fill up the gaps and make it waterproof. But it's not actually got a waterproofing on. And so Ventile was invented during the war. My dad was on the Arctic convoys. And suddenly Cortols came up with this new material instead of these great big duffel coats that when he took them off would just stand there, mm. weighed a ton. They had Ventile and he said it changed their whole view of the winter up in the North Cape. Um, so Ventile was a, a wartime invention. Now I heard, and uh, you may know that for those that are watching that, um, that know their rugby, that the one mill that made Ventile was bought by Bill Beaumont, which was his essentially his retirement money. I didn't know the that. Mill, the mill, because it's a, there's a finite supply, this yeah. one mill that's making it in the, in the north of England. Yeah. Um, and it, he recognised he recognised its worth, you know, about 40 years ago. Yeah. And as, a, as an investment. Wow. Now, I, I don't know where I've, I've corroborated, to, but it's... Uh, I'll find that I, out. I think that's uh, um, it's something I heard sort of on good authority. These are the anoraks we use. They're, again, ventile. They're no good if it's, they're not much good if it's just wet rain. I see the difference between yours and mine is that you have a nice furry hood. Yeah, they were so discontinued clearly. in 1973. So 1992, no hood. <laughs> and mine wasn't issued with a hood, but I had some fur from some other oh, source. Oh, I see. I oh, you, oh, that's very but good. But in 1973 was the year they discontinued Wolverine fur. Right, OK. There's the two furs that never freeze up, a Wolverine and Husky. So you could have a pelt from a husky, but we didn't like to do that. So no, this is no. Wolverine. But they're uh, they're so amazing, there. and and a big pocket. Yes. And uh, and that's I mean, month after month we wore those. And do that, you know the only addition that we had is we had two. We I had this was my main one, and then we when we were doing bird ringing, and yeah, dealing with petrels, you get covered in yeah. petrol vomit, and that lived in a separate space because of the smell was yeah. outrageous. And uh, I certainly didn't hang on to that one, but this is the one no, that I had for um, my field travel. Well, when I went to the Antarctic for two and a half years, all we were issued with our clothing in the Falkland Islands, and I went ashore with nothing, and I came back with this kit bag that tall and about that round, and it had 12 pairs of underpants, six pairs of trousers, uh, th three or four pairs of those, uh, three of those anoraks, two base anoraks, unbelievable amount of stuff, but... There was very well, little. I can to see come also. I've just I've brought a couple of others. So in comparison, you have better. This is again natural fibres. This is the Daxteen mitts with the poly with the yeah. wax cotton outside. These are what I wore. These but were not issued by Bass. Okay. We took the cargo down for an American station, Palmer Station, and um, we helped them unload all their cargo. And at the end of the day, uh, they said, "Oh, that's really kind." But what? And we had some gloves on, and they weren't very good. They said, "Those aren't very nice gloves. Would you like another pair?" So I got given three pairs of those, and they are the most fantastic bear paw mitts. Um, but they were given to me by the Americans. The British gloves, they didn't even have bear paws at all. Right. They didn't issue them, but they're just, they're just great. And when, you, when your face freezes up in the very cold, and, just, uh, and just somebody else, your companion will say, you, your cheeks have just gone white. You just, you just do this, and they can bring them back to life. Your yeah. nose goes white or your cheeks go white. Yeah. They're just unbelievably effective. And they're also quite... I can be quite dexterous with them too. Fantastic. They're, they're just the most yeah. best gloves ever, but not really much use in this country. No, slightly over. And those look like they're Canadian or... They were made... I worked in the Arctic in 69, and they were made for me by a young Eskimo lady, um, a lovely lady, and she made me a pair of uh, mucklucks made from seal skin. And when I went to the Antarctic in 73, we got given rubber and canvas mucklucks but I, I took these and I actually what I wore when it was minus oh, 40, fantastic. just with socks inside. And they're just yes. very, very, no good in the wet, but actually when it's minus 40, it's not wet. It's no, too cold. Just, just cold. So, yeah. it's, so those were my personal mucklucks. No one else had ones like that. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Oh, you're most welcome. I, you know, we have a lot of similarities with what we have and it's nice to share and see the differences and what hasn't changed. If it's that good, why change it? Absolutely. Mm. Thank you very much for showing me the, uh, the field operation. Yeah, it was a bit of a cheat because that, Dad didn't actually make that sledge or okay. the tent. 
Um, but there was an exhibition at the Royal Geographical Society in 1949, I think it was. Dad happened to be working there at the time. And I think that at the very last moment the exhibition was pulled, but by then somebody had made the model Nansen sledge and Camtors, who'd made the, the pyramid tents for Bass, had made the tent. And nobody else seemed to want it, so Dad pocketed it. Fantastic. And, and, and since then we've made the boxes and things and we've used them in lectures. And in fact, that tent and sledge have been to the Antarctic with me on a cruise ship. Oh, right, that sounds very nice. It's a little pocket one. And just to pick you up on uh, the Royal Geographical Society, um, we're both fellows of the Royal Geographical Society, of the uh, FRGS, um, and that is, uh, for our American viewers, is like the British version, if you like, of the Explorers Club. It's, would you I say would that? I think so. Uh, yes, yeah, it's based not... in London, next door to Imperial College yep. um, in South Kensington, and has been very much in the past the sort of the hub of expeditionary... Um, Interest all, over the world. all over the world. From and, Livingston and, and Stanley to, yes. to Scott. Um, even Amundsen had some involvement there. Shackleton was a bit persona non grata at the, uh, the RGS. But, and, and, and they've had a massive impact on all British expeditions and yes. exploration since 1830. Um, yeah. And if anything, it feels maybe less so now. Yes, they, I, they I look, are more, I look at, I look they're at more it, a... Yeah. An academic institution, the Institute of British Geographers, yes. has its base there. So it's, it's, it's a twixt in between. It's still involved with expeditions, but it's also an academic institution, um, but a, a fantastically historic place. It's to, lovely. And, and yeah. I mean, I guess 100 years ago, you had to pretty much get the blessing of the Royal Geographic Society to, Completely. Yeah. to be heading out to the wilds. Yeah. And they, and you, they thought, people think that, oh, it, if you're an RGS expedition, you're completely funded, you're sorted. The RGS doesn't have money. It has enough to run its headquarters. But it doesn't actually fund Do I fund recall that you've worked there too? Uh, yeah, I did. Yes. Um, I, in 1980, they had their 150th anniversary expedition to the Karakoram Himalaya. Okay. And I was in charge of their survey programme. But... I didn't have a job, so I was part-time at University College London, part-time youth worker in Brixton at the time of the riots, and um, part-time at the RGS in their newly formed Expedition Advisory Centre, right. literally answering the phone and helping out where I could. And, um, with, uh, you know, and, and so it was very much... And that was a non-paid thing. It was just I, I had some time and I found it really interesting. Um, so that was, uh, that was a by-the-by sort of thing. But yeah, it's to work at the RGS. If there's anywhere more historic about exploration in the country than the Scott Pole or than the RGS. Oh, I, I have the same feeling when I go to the, the library and the yeah. map room in particular yeah, yeah. At, the, at the Royal Geographic Society yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, another kind of old British institution oh, I guess, involved so. with yes. expeditions. Yes. And sometimes it has to work hard to keep up with the times, but it's, it's done it well actually over the years. Yes. Yeah, it's evolved. And... To go back to surveying and how it's evolved, and, and you were saying you're surveying in the Himalayas and so on, have you done other surveying around the Antarctic? Um, yeah, sort of. I mean, I, I worked with Bass as a glaciologist, so surveying was just part of my job. Right. But then I've worked and gone around uh, not just um, with Bass, but with a commercial organisation. Um, looking for runways where they can land very large aircraft on wheels, which is called, uh, they call blue ice runways. You can't land big aircraft with wheels on snow because they sink in. Mm. But you can land things like up to a 727 aircraft on wheels if the surface of the ice is just that, bare blue ice. But it has to be very flat. It has to be long enough. They want three kilometres because the one thing you can't do when you land on ice is put the brakes on. So you yes. can only slow down by going to reverse thrust. So and actually, it's very topical. I wonder what your view is. Just in the last few weeks, Norway has just put a Boeing 787 Dreamliner down yeah. in Johnning Maudland, I guess near Troll Base. I don't know which, yes. which uh, that was, uh, airfield that, it is. That or... wasn't a runway that I found. That was a runway that my brother-in-law found. Uh, oh, right, OK. A different brother-in-law than what I mentioned earlier. But no, I, I, I went quite a long way around the Antarctic looking for blue ice runways and I did find a very are good they, one. How long are they? Are they three kilometres long, okay. um, two or three hundred metres wide, never more than one percent gradient in any direction. 
Right, so and that's the key. Flat bits is quite hard to find. Flat <laughs> bits, and, and, yes. and, the, and we knew where to look because we had satellite imagery. And if yes. you've got colour satellite imagery, the blue bits are bare ice. And if you look at a, a, a satellite image over a 10 year period and it's always that bit is always blue, you think that's ice free, that's snow free. So Hence, you go there and have blue ice runway. Absolutely blue ice runway. And, and, and the, the big one that they use now at, pay, at um, Union Glacier, yes. that's my runway. I found it, I surveyed it, and it's proving to be incredibly uh, important. Troll is another one. Um, blue one in Johnny Maud Land is another one. That's, that's one of my runways. Um, you still feel super. that sense of propriety? Yeah, of, yes, absolutely did. <laughs> yes. I mean, we landed in a twin otter, camped in a pyramid tent, and I spent a day and a half surveying the runway. Um, and then got the results and wrote a report, and, 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 and that's how, it, how, how we did and it. And I guess there's the blue ice runways, and then there's the gravel runways that have also... There are only three... Marsh and Rotherham. There are three gravel runways yeah. in Antarctica. There's Marambio, uh, very little used, and our Argentinian base on the tip of the peninsula. Yes. There's Frey Station, uh, yes. the Chilean runway on King George Island. Yes. And then there's Rothera base. And in fact, I had a, an input to Rothera runway because uh, they wanted to put a base in Rothera in 1961. And they had a base, all the huts on board this ship. And they got round... Adelaide Island, but there's too much sea ice, so they couldn't land at Rothera because it's a nice big flat area of stone. And so they actually unloaded this base. The, the ship's captain said, well, I've got to unload it somewhere. I'm not taking it home. So they unloaded it, it, in they unloaded it at Adelaide Base, which yes. is a, a scrutty little patch of rock. And that's where they built the base. And they had a runway there on the, on the ice on the glacier just above Adelaide Base. It was always intended to go to Rothera, but they couldn't get there. But that back, then in 75, they had another look at Rothera because sea ice conditions were changing and yes. getting easier. And they, the, the field operations manager, Steve Wormold, said, Jonathan, could you, you're a surveyor, can you go to Rothera Point and survey the whole point? And by the way, while you're there, will you draw some potential lines of a runway roughly in this area and draw a long section and cross sections? And so, so that's what I did. I had 10 glorious days with my colleague and friend, Graham, camped on the foreshore in Rothera when there were no huts there, no human habitation, just the wildlife. We woke up one morning with a penguin inside the tent, curious. Yes. And to be there with that pristine conditions and see it now, which is a, a, a really full-blown runway, big base. Big base, yes. And, um, and a very effective base um, is something quite different. But uh, to, to actually survey the runway and then see it come to fruition is, is, a, is a great uh, treat for me. Yes, yeah. and it feels like actually when, when, you have, when one has an opportunity to go back in the Antarctic and things that in younger career were built in that sort of time when it was pristine has gone through the full cycle of being used and then has become heritage. Yeah, um, well, I'm going to tell you Dan another story. Hart, for example. I was going to or, just yeah. come on yes. to that. Our, yes. our brains are going very similar yes. places here. Um, they... They couldn't get into Adelaide Station in the early 70s um, um, by ship, usually until late December, early January, at the very earliest. So it meant that and, and the last ship had to leave Marguerite Bay, which is down the peninsula, um, early, early March. So yeah. it was a very short field season for people coming in to do summer-only science. So once the decision was made to actually do most of the science in the summer, you had to look at the potential for getting scientists in early. If you could get scientists into Rother or Adelaide Station in October, then suddenly your length of field season was doubled. Mm. So um, they thought, well, we can't get them into Adelaide Station, but they found a place up further north near the British station of Port Lockroy, and they found a place on Duma Island. Um, and they said, look, we could get people ashore here, we could build a small hut as a transit base, we could fly planes that were already down at Adelaide Island with skis back up to Duma and ferry the scientists into Adelaide Island to, to do the scientific mm, work. Yeah. Much of, uh, talking about mid-October because it was mm, much more ice-free. So, yes. so they got the ship down to Duma Island in 76. Oh, and um, yeah, in 76. And lo and behold, there was too much sea ice so they couldn't get into Duma Island. So they found another bay about 
five miles away called Damoy Point, a little da little point, Damoy Point, and they landed there and built a little hut, and just above it there was a glacier which was just big enough for the planes. Mm. And and that that this is a complete diversion here, but when um, I was in the Antarctic in the mid seventies, I got a a, 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 not a, a letter from my father saying we're building a new house in England on the Malvern Hills and it's being made about this amazing material which is heavily insulated panels and it's going to be built in two days and uh, it's really good insulation and we can't get a central heating system that's small enough for it and I said that sounds really interesting dad and um, but can you tell Al Smith, who was the chief buildings officer of the Antarctic Survey about it, because I think they'd be interested, because mm. they were building it with amateur labour. Next thing I knew, the following season, 75, 76, two buildings were on the way to the Antarctic. The oh, so first insulated, one, prefabricated. Exactly the same material, um, um, uh, called structure ply, and the first building in Antarctica made of structure ply was Damoy, and right. they built it in about a week, and, and then they went built phase one at Rothera, um, later that summer, so uh, sort of dad, I dad by myself introduced bass to structure ply, and many bases all around the peninsula and Halley were okay. built of the oh. same material, and it does work very well. I was in Damoy uh, earlier this year, when it has just been redecorated and renovated by yeah. the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, and it was lovely to see again. That was actually with our, our but colleague you, Nick, just seeing that full cycle. And, but um, if you sit inside the base, the old panels, which were stamped with the name of the destination, it doesn't say Damoy, it says Duma Island. Oh, really? And, so and that's where it was... A clue of where it was intended to go. That was where it was supposed to go. So I know the, the, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you just got to think, well, that doesn't work, so we've got to find something else that does. Yes. And a lot of, lot of stuff in the Antarctic, well, we can't do what we thought we were going to do, so we've got to make make another arrangement and, and it works you've just got to think you know um, the, the the station that I was on uh, was a combination of uh, an old whaling station yeah. and the, also a, um, a telephone exchange from the Falkland Islands that was repurposed as a sort of insulated plastic box yeah which terrible static but uh, was put together in, the, in I guess in the 60s um, Adelaide Station had one very similar. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, maybe they're a job lot. To, yeah, to I suspect share. so. But um, uh, I'm keen to just also wind a little bit further back, just to 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 tap into some of your your other experiences. Um, by coincidence, uh, given that we're in the in the Spry here, uh, yesterday I was uh, had for the pleasure of the very first time. Or to see the Royal Research Ship Discovery, so Scott's yeah, ship yeah. that he took down, not in the infamous race to the pole, but when he was doing the scientific work between uh, 1902 ship. to 1904. It's a wonderfully well-found vessel. And I found out with interest uh, that uh, she was, uh, for a while after she'd been used, in London as a Sea Scout ship. That's right. So... Um, I've brought something of my own here, which is um, I wanted to see, because I know that you're a scout leader. Um, so this, I was a sea scout, and you're saying how you had a, a father that uh, obviously inspired on the Antarctic things. I didn't have that, but uh, I've brought my, my sea scout, Whoa, jersey, that's my sea scout jersey here, um, which was from the 80s. But uh, I was a member of the 14th Richmond Vikings Sea Scout Group. So somewhat circle, prescient it? of being now where I work. Um, significance being that uh, the RRS Discovery, the Scots ship, was based, as I understand it, on the Thames um, as a Sea Scout vessel. Yeah. So I guess that natural connection of exploration, the things that the scouting movement can do, which amazing global movement and, and I understand that you're a, a scout leader I don't know whether you I, now inspire new explorers or you I well you know one of my lines is when I'm giving a talk in a school or something is at the end of the talk I said well I hope you found this interesting and I hope for one or two of you it struck a spark and you're now thinking maybe I can do that when I grow up that's somewhere a spark was struck in me. It was rather later in life. Mm -hmm. but And I hope the spark that I've struck in you today means that in 15 years' time, you'll be here in this school 
giving a lecture all about your time in the Antarctic. Absolutely. And if that happens, then I've succeeded in my mission because mm. I want people to understand what an amazing place the Antarctic is. And, and it's open for anyone. If you've got the, the right skills and the right personality, if you're a good cook, there's a job in the Antarctic. If you're a good mechanic, electrician, mm. a scientist, um, a meteorologist, all, all sorts of different jobs, and you like people, and you have to like people. Yes. And so much of Antarctic and my memories of it, and I'm sure yours, are the people you've met during your it time. Is, in it the, is. It's absolutely. all about people. Absolutely. And the, um, do you know, actually, when we're, when we're hiring, if I see someone as a scout or an Eagle Scout from an American perspective, whatever, I think that is a very useful, I'm biased, of course, but a very useful core skill set for expeditioning in the Antarctic for all those things you've described. And certainly in my experience, people often think that it's isolated. They say, oh, you've spent time on an Antarctic base or a ship or whatever. You say, how do you cope with the isolation? To me, cities are the isolating places yep. and that actually being down in the Antarctic is intense. In, uh, intense. Maybe not friendship, no but there is... Yeah, intense, exactly. <laughs> um, that... It's, it's not solely about friendship because it's about colleagues working together. There is a friendship there, for, but you don't have to be friends with everyone. But working very closely together where if you do not cooperate, then, um, well, you, you, you know, the worst can happen. It sadly does. So it was the opposite of being an isolating experience for me. It was You've the, really, most, yeah. the most close bonding with any humans that I've experienced. You've as... really got to like people. Yes. Uh, to, to share a tent with one person for six weeks and not see anybody else. Uh, whether or not you actually like them, you've got to get on with them. You've got to work together, so you might as well like them. Um, and and yeah. it, it, amazing, I can think of people who I, I didn't get to understand for probably six months, and then I did understand them. I thought, oh, I really was... Um, I got that all wrong for six months. And they're a they're a true blue person, you know, yeah, a good a good sort. Um, and uh, and sometimes you meet someone in in a in a in an evening, you think, oh, I'm not worried about whether I meet that person again. And actually, you're missing out because if you delved a little bit deeper and you got to talking more, you'd find out what truly remarkable people some people are. Absolutely. Um, in this in this day, we know a lot of people a little bit. In the Antarctic, you know a few people a lot. Absolutely. It's very interesting, isn't it, how, how the, you know, those groupings and how yeah. so many of the people I've known that have been guides down and spent time, as you say, in tents and maybe been weathered in for three, four weeks at a time where in a little pyramid tent, as we've just seen, yeah. for weeks and weeks, um, you get to know people. And um, I, I guess, I mean, what's the longest time that you've been there? Weathered in. Have you got? Have you? Do you have any particular experiences of being? Yeah, a few. Stuck for what well, I did over four hundred nights in a pyramid tent. Yes. And my longest lie up was sixteen days. Gosh. And sixteen days. The saying is, you only go outside for the bare essentials, and they get very cold in the process. If you yes, absolutely. Me. But, I'll, and I'll tell you a, a little side story here, that I was out with uh, three others in two tents, and we'd been out about three weeks. And we'd finished about the 8th of December, something like that. And we were waiting for a plane to come and take us back to base. This was in late 75. And um, we had lots of food left. Anyway, we got stuck and we got stuck and the weather was bad. So the plane couldn't come in to take us out. We had days when it was cloudy but not windy. So we went outside and built an igloo and slept a night in an igloo. And that was fun. And then um, we had a, had a more wait and... Uh, Hang on, there's only about nine days food left, guys. We'd better start hanging the tea bags up in the top of the tent to dry. And, um, and then it was Christmas Eve. We thought we were going to be well out by then. And I, a little note dropped through the um, top of the tent um, from the other tent saying, the inhabitants of tent two, the Marion Glacier, invite the inhabitants of tent one, the Marion Glacier, to pre-Christmas drinks. Oh, very so civilised. It was very yeah. civilised. And we'd... Uh, before I left the base, I'd, I'd secreted a, a bottle of rum because you only take a little bit. Uh, no, it was, sorry, I hadn't secreted a bottle of rum. They, I'd secreted four little bottles of rather nice Christmas drinks. And two days out from base, uh, one of the other guys who was quite new uh, uh, this 
So, oh, by the way, Jonathan, I know you told us to pack light, but I've, I've brought a bottle of whiskey with me. Um, I wrapped it in my, and I said, you know, I did ask you to uh, pack light. We're under quite a load limit here. Um, but however, you've done it. Thank you. That'll be lovely if we're still out yes. when we need it. So anyway, they had invited us for Christmas. And so at, at 10 o'clock on Christmas Eve, we went across to their tent. And there were these two very glum looking glaciologists saying, um, you know, the bottle of whiskey I put in the bottom of my kit bag, it's not whiskey, it's lime juice. Oh, really? <laughs> they packed the wrong, they'd rack, oh, my and word. I said, don't worry. And I went back to my tent and picked up the little bottles of what I had secreted. And we had a nice pre-Christmas drink. But it just, so a little alcohol goes a long way. But it, and you know that, that nowadays there is a different way in which so much of Antarctica is run in terms of being dry bases and dry ships and so on. Mm. I have the same memories actually from the British Antarctic Survey of, of being quite alcohol driven in, in a social way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think there is a long tradition going way back to the origins of, of those exploring that, that um, uh, an appropriate whiskey or similar was, was, was very much the fuel that kept people going. Um, I know that uh, the base I was on had a had a formidable reputation for the for the uh, the drinking that we that we did on base. It's fine. Yes. Um, when you're away from base, when we went out travelling and living in a pyramid tent, we would take a bottle of rum and it would last us six weeks because yes. it was an occasional treat. Alcohol and extreme cold don't really mix. Yes. But uh, on base, not only was it available, but it was actually part of our wages. We got given uh, 12 bottles of spirits each a year as part of that was well, that, included that's part in of the your ration. remuneration. Yes. Yeah, that was that, well, not a remuneration, it was just part of the rations that we yes. supplied with. Same as, I don't know, 3,000 cigarettes every month. I suppose it's a spin off of the grog ration narrative. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and so alcohol was in plentiful supply and you could buy more from the ship. Um, some people, if they were going to be on base all year, would drink quite a bit, totally in control. Mm. And it, it was quite rare for alcohol to become a problem on a base. It was really mm. quite rare because I think that a certain amount of sifting had gone on before they even got to base as to whether yes. they were likely to be. No, I've, I've seen a couple of cases of alcoholism, but mm. it's not a big deal. Um, lots of cases of, of drinking quite a lot, but that was... Yes, that I mean, was, that's sort of my memory of it being... Uh, a sort of an important social lubricant, I suppose. Yeah, at least was. there was that sort of. That's how it felt. But at certainly, that time. when you once you got out on, in the in the in the Bundu um, traveling, alcohol played a very small part. Oh really? Okay. I'll, 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 can I tell you a story about alcohol? Oh, please, oh, please do. This yeah. is this, this is, is a, a story that goes back over a hundred years. Oh, fantastic! And um, back in 1907, um, Ernest Shackleton was leaving New Zealand, and the wonderful people of Dunedin said take this with you and they gave him a big barrel of beer a hogshead of, of beer he uh, lashed it down on the deck they got to the Antarctic and um, and when they got there um, they, it was absolutely all out to build a base before the winter came because time was short so they worked incredibly hard and after I don't know six weeks eight weeks and winter was really fast approaching Shackleton um, who's a great hero of mine um, decided they were going to have a day's respite. Tomorrow is a holiday. And um, so they, he said, ah, we were given a barrel of beer. Can somebody find it? It's somewhere out there. Not lime juice. Then. No, it wasn't lime juice. No. no. And they found this barrel of beer and they brought it in, stood it on the kitchen table and he told the, the cook to put a corkscrew in and put a corkscrew and decant a pint of beer for each man. So the cook did that. And all but one of the men on the base uh, had a pint of this beer. And the one man who was teetotal wrote, it, wrote down the consequences in his diary. Um, who he, he later became um, Sir Raymond Priestley. And, um, and what had happened was the barrel of beer had formed a layer of ice all around the outside of the barrel. And the, the cook had tapped into the centre where there was very, very strong beer liqueur. Mm. So all these men who'd had no alcohol for three, four months suddenly had a pint of beer liqueur and they all fell down almost unconscious. And it's all written up. 
And I won't, the follow on from that is don't try this at home because you might get into trouble. But, um, but it is, uh, it's, a, it's a good story. It's a true Absolutely. story from Antarctic annals, yeah. And I understand that there is whiskey also that was recreated from Shackleton's that yeah. you can now buy. I mean, it's, the, the it's Heritage very... Trust in New Zealand were, were renovating Shackleton's base and under the floorboards they found um, a case with 11 out of 12 bottles um, intact and it was a special whiskey and I can't remember who the distiller were but it was made especially for Shackleton's expedition Nimrod in 1907 to 1909 mm. and so they some of the bottles disappeared into pockets but some of them got back to the UK and they were taken to the distillers who had built uh, distilled this and said could you recreate this and in fact over the last 10 years the, they did recreate it, it's called Shackleton whiskey, and I first saw it when I went to my local co-op in the, in the West Country. And yes, I think it is interna it's internationally available now. Yeah, I think it's, as, and, as and a blended whiskey, isn't it? Yes, it's a blended whiskey, but it's uh, it, uh, for me. Of there course, is the, the yes. Last yeah. time I Resonates went to the Antarctic, with, I yeah. took a bottle with me. Put Fantastic. it that way. Yes, and uh, and so yeah, Antarctic history is is very short. I mean, the first people to actually step foot in the Antarctic. It's only, only 125 years ago on, on the mainland. Mm. And yet so much has happened in that 125 years. Of course, there's the, the scientific era and, and progress, massive progress being made from those early days. But it's all squashed into a very short time frame. So yes. me, me personally, my, f my family history goes back to my godfather who was there in 1934. And that's only 35 years after the first person stepped foot on the Antarctic. And, and the family involvement has gone on ever since. It's the same year that the Scott Polar Research Institute was, was created. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. It uh, is. By Frank Debenham. Um, um, so it, it's all Antarctic history. Human Antarctic history is very, very short, but some fantastic stories. Um, many of which, of course, are, are, are faithfully uh, are recorded here in the Scott Polar Institute. Um, it's uh, the most. If you like the Antarctic or the Arctic, just spend at least two weeks sitting in the library here because you'll be fascinated. So Jonathan, you're talking about a 50 year involvement uh, since you first started here at uh, Spry and you're still involved. Where's it go from here? Uh, I never had any imagination when I joined Bass in July 1973 that I would still be involved 50 years on. It was a two and a half year contract doing a dream of a job I'd have done it for nothing, but I wasn't going to tell them that. They were paying me a salary, and it was like the biggest adventure you could ever have, doing just what I wanted to do, um, living a dream. Um, and somehow, at the same time, I've run a business, I've had a family, one of whom is actually driven to the South Pole. Yes, that's another, another story. Absolutely, yes. The complete another story. And, um, and I'm just so lucky, because I've been allowed to carry on this involvement. Nowadays, I worked with an organisation telling stories and guiding them in Antarctica. But it still gives me this op opportunity once a year to go back to this wonderful place that I love. Um, and the, one of the nicest things was some years ago, my wife who's put up with over 40 years of, of seeing me head off to the Antarctic every now and again. 10 years ago, I was able to take her with me on a ship and after two days, she said, I get it now. I absolutely understand why you have to come back. And to me, it's been a love affair that's been going on longer than my love affair with my wife. And, and I think most people, and I'm sure you'd agree, it's a love affair that you have as well. Long may it continue. Thank you so much for sharing your reflections yeah. uh, with us uh, on Viking TV. You're most welcome. I, I love talking about the Antarctic. You've probably worked that out. <laughs>